The U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry in Jordan for what could be a last chance to revive the peace process while the Arab League in Kuwait declares a total rejection of the Jewish state. In his first visit to EU headquarters, American President Barack Obama lashes out against Russian aggression in Crimea. A Turkish court reverses the government imposed ban on Twitter in the country six days after Prime Minister Erdogan ordered it to wipe out the social network. Welcome back to the news today. This is the Daily Debate. 35 years ago, an historic peace treaty between Israel and Egypt was signed. It was the first time that Israel achieved fully diplomatic relations with one of its neighboring countries. And it also paved the way for better relations with other Arab countries. In the last years, there, are, there have been loud voices from both sides on reassessing the treaty on the claims it is not a real peace. 35 years later, we will try to understand, is this the right peace treaty for the Middle East, and is it now at risk? Joining me tonight is Ambassador Yitzhak Levanon, former Israeli ambassador to Egypt. Good evening. Thank Hello, you very much evening, for coming. And Dr. Efraim Kam, senior research yeah. fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies. Good evening. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming. So, um, you know, people are, love to say the phrase, um, this is a cold peace. And we cannot ignore the fact that this is a cold peace. It wasn't never very warm. You see, I would prefer a cold peace to a warm war. It's much, much better, believe me. Uh, look, peace is peace. And we should look at it at two different levels. The first level is the framework, the signature, the paper, the documents. This is the framework of the peace between us and Egypt. And this is has been excellent till now. And I think that it will continue in the future, too. And the second level is the bilateral relation, which is much less, let's say, uh, than, than the frame uh, between us and Egypt. And I think that we should inject some effort in the future, uh, let's say, to inject some substance in these bilateral relations. But I definitely prefer a cold peace, or what they call it, a so-called cold peace, to a belligerency or violence or war between both countries. It was a very brave step and a very hard step to Israel to do this mm -hmm. peace treaty. Not for Israel, for Egypt it was. Not for Israel, was it? it no, for, for Israel always wanted a peace with Egypt. So there was no problem to conclude any peace treaty with Egypt. I think the main, if main the most important step was taken by Egypt, by the late President Sadat. I think without him, without his decision to come to Jerusalem, no peace treaty would uh, have been uh, concluded between the two parties. But t going out of Sinai with a Likud party uh, in the government, this is not something easy because we are seeing it happening right now that Israel cannot even go out from the West Bank to get to a certain agreement with the Palestinians. Yes, but there is a major difference between the West Bank and then the Sinai Peninsula. It was easy, for, relatively easy for Israel to evacuate the Sinai Peninsula. It is much, much more difficult to evac evacuate uh, the West Bank. Is it much uh, uh, easier Bank, to uh, evacuate Sinai than the West Bank? I think that the peace treaty, it is a courageous step uh, of the two countries, not only Egypt, Israel too. We have to take ourselves back 35 years uh, ago, when the atmosphere in Israel, we were sitting in Sinai, we had the oil field, we had the airports, we were strong, sitting on the Suez Canal. Uh, I mean, the fact that Israel decided to withdraw from Sinai, from, from the totality of the peninsula, and to go back to the lines of 1967, it is indeed a courageous step, but definitely the, the, the courageous or the courage of Sadat it is exceptional because if you will take his steps, what he did, he, he did it not only in front of his own people, but in front of the whole Arab world. And he decided that that's it, enough is enough. And he would like, in order to restitute for themselves Sinai, he should go for something called peace with Israel. And this is what he did. And this is a courageous step. 
This is a courageous step, but you know, uh, we're looking uh, at what is happening right now in Egypt. And uh, it's, it's, you know, we used to go to Sinai a few years ago. Now you don't see a lot of Israelis going to Sinai because they are afraid to enter Egypt. And this is not supposed to be the relationship between two countries that has peace. Correct. But, you know, you have to look at the situation in, in different different ways. One of these is that the peace treaty survived all the upheavals in the Middle East, in Egypt, and everything. He survived even wars that we launched, you know, against the Palestinians and in Lebanon, etc. So the, the peace treaty became, after 35 years, as a national interest in Egypt and in Israel. Because both countries, and if we are talking about Egypt, I think that the Egyptian, the army institution, understand very well what is the alternative to that. So this is why uh, I think that this peace treaty survived because he became a national interest in Egypt and in Israel. When President Anwar Sadat is saying, uh, I want to come to your parliament and I want to give a speech there, saying this to the Israelis and doing this step, you're looking at a major leadership step that maybe today you won't see it anywhere in the Middle East. I think Sadat, in this sense, was uh, was unique. Nasser couldn't do it, wouldn't do it. I'm not sure that Mubarak, after Sadat, would do it. Sadat was a unique uh, personality, a unique leader in the Arab world, in Egypt itself. Uh, when when he came to Jerusalem, I was the head of the Egyptian department in the Israeli intelligence, and we were surprised. We took into account that he's changing his condition for peace. We have identified this uh, change. But nobody thought about the possibility that he would suggest uh, and come to Jerusalem in order to conclude the peace treaty. It was a major surprise for us. It was a major surprise. What do you remember from this day? In what sense? In, from seeing him on the podium speaking to the Israelis, and this is Anwar Sadat. As one who followed him for some years before he came, I was personally I was very excited, very excited. Look, it is a historical uh, event. I mean, Anwar Sadat, Anwar Sadat he came after Nasser. Nasser was charismatic. Nasser was the head of the uh, Arab nationalism. And, and everybody gave uh, Anwar Sadat probably two or three months. And suddenly, he became the leader of war and the leader of peace, uh, the hero of peace and the hero of war. So when he came to the Knesset in Jerusalem, it was we were thrilled because I mean, this is this is the leader of the uh, biggest and the strongest Arab country. Arab country. We fought four times, and suddenly he is in the Knesset. And when I read again and again his speech in the Knesset, he say exactly what we don't want to hear. He say everything. You have to give the Palestinian state. You have to go back to sixty-seven. He say that. So this, this is the, the, the historical moment that in front of 120 members of the Knesset, of the Israeli Knesset, he said that exactly what he thinks. So if you can, can you imagine, uh, let's say, uh, this speech, maybe to do a copy paste to the speech and put it in the mouth of uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas? Do you, and he is <coughs> saying the same speech in the Knesset. Do you think that it will be accepted today? No. No, because unfortunately, uh, look, we have been dealing with the Palestinians for the last uh, substantial, uh, you know, uh, period of time, I, 20, 20 years, 25 years. So, we, we, I mean, there is, there, is, there is a kind of an image on both sides. So I think it will be difficult. And if it will come to the Knesset, it's not Sadat who came uh, uh, to the Knesset. But if you will take the speech of Sadat and you will t depict you know, all the messages inside, you hear Mahmoud Abbas today. There is no change in terms of um, uh, giving a solution to the Palestinian issue. There is no change at all between the two speeches. So this means that the Arab side, and more specifically the Palestinians, did not change their position in one iota in and terms of their demand. And you can reach actually peace with these ideas. Look, I think that we need a, a great effort to reach peace. I think that if we can solve a few things which are important for each side, I mean, this is the kind of the compromise that we are looking for. And I think that we can reach it if, if each side will be more flexible. 
But if you stick to your guns all the time, you cannot move that much. I, I believe that the Palestinian problem is much, much more complicated than our relationship with Egypt back in 1967 or 73. It was easier for Israel to give back the Sand Peninsula, as I said before, much more difficult to give back the, the, the West Bank. And indeed, following the 67 wars, the Israeli government said explicitly that it's willing to give back those territories to, territories to Egypt and Syria even uh, in return for real peace. It didn't say the same thing about the West Bank. No, the West uh, Bank is more complicated. In Camp David, in this peace treaty, the Palestinians were included, but Israel didn't fulfill its part in this part of the treaty. How come? No, it's not correct. Which means? Look, <clears throat> Camp David has uh, two, two faults, okay? The first one is the peace treaty, the bilateral peace treaty between the two countries. And the second fault is the kind of the self-government or the auto autonomy, what we call it, you know, autonomia, that we used to say it at the time uh, to the Palestinians. But Sadat cannot speak on behalf of the Palestinians. Secondly, the Palestinians rejected immediately. And Yasser Arafat joined the front of refusal. If you remember, you know, with Syria, Iraq, and, and Libya, and, 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 and Algeria, against, you know, this peace treaty. But Israel was ready, and they signed the Camp David in giving a kind of a self-rule to the Palestinians. So Israel was ready to do it. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, um, to look at the situation. Um, and to look at what is happening with the Palestinians from this perspective, from today, today the Palestinians, let's see what is happening in the Gaza Strip in front of what is happening uh, in, uh, in Egypt. Today the Palestinians are not getting much of a support from, at least from the Gaza Strip, we're seeing they're not getting a lot of support from Egypt. Well, I, to, my, to my humble understanding, and I'm following the Middle East for a certain period of time, I think that today the Palestinians are receiving from their colleagues and, and brothers only a verbal support, nothing more than that. Because each one of the countries has its own problems. Look, Egypt has a problem, Libya has a problem, and Tunisia has a problem, uh, Saudi Arabia has a problem. Every, every country has its own problem, and they would like to solve this problem. So the issue of the Palestinian cause or the Palestinian issue is it is on the table, but this, there is a different urgency now for all these countries. And I think the Palestinians are failing to understand or to read properly what's going on in the Middle East. They should grab, you know, whatever they, uh, somebody is giving them anything in order to start a new life. You know, in a few minutes, uh, General Abdel Fattah Sisi is going to give a declaration uh, to the press. <coughs> Probably he will uh, uh, talk about uh, running for the presidency. If we try to look at uh, maybe the next president of Egypt, Abdel Fattah Sisi, and we try to compare him to Mubarak and to Sadat, what kind of a leader do we see here? I think that the, the Egyptians are uh, comparing Abdel Fattah Sisi not to Mubarak, definitely not to Mubarak, and not to Sadat, but rather to Gamal Abdel Nasser. And I think that um, we start to see some first, uh, uh, let's say, symptoms that he would like really to be a kind of the nationalistic leader, the one who is uniting all com the, 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 I mean, the, 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 the Egyptian people, but he would like also to play a role in the Middle East and in the Arab countries. So I would say that he is more, uh, let's say, close to Gamal Abdel Nasser in his thoughts than to Sadat or to anybody else. I believe there's going to be a major difference between Sisi, whatever he's going to do, do and, and Gamal Abdel Nasser. Sisi will not be able to be the leader of the Arab world because the Arab world today is much weaker than it was during the 50s or the 60s. It is, the main Arab states are preoccupied with their own domestic problems. Look at Syria, look at Iraq. I don't think that Egyptian, an Egyptian leader, whatever, whoever he is, will be able to lead this, this <coughs> divided Arab world. Do you think that uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi is, uh, let's say, uh, you know, there is a phrase in Hebrew, Tov la uh, is he good for Israel? Much better than his former, than, uh, than Morsi, for example. Much better than Morsi, much better than Mubarak? I still don't know. I think it's too early to judge. But, uh, you know, he has, 
he has he knows Israel I think he knows Israeli uh, uh, military command uh, I think he'll be quite convenient relatively speaking to, to Israel if, as far as I can judge at this moment I'm not so sure you're not so sure no but look I mean we cannot uh, it's really premature now to speak about that uh, but I have to take into account you know um, uh, some of his positions in the past, the way that he behaved. Look, he has been Minister of Defense for at least a year and something, a year and a half. Yeah. But usually, if there is a good relations, or he had the idea of having good relations with Israel, he should have invited you know, his counterpart, the Israeli, yeah. uh, to come and visit, or he will come to visit us. But, uh, uh, but you know, uh, Mr. Lebanon, I, I, we have uh, to finish, but you know, Mr. Lebanon, sometimes um, not speaking is better than speaking, uh, in some cases, especially here in the Middle East. Gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for this. We're going out for a small break, two minutes break, and then we will be back with I-24 News one-on-one. -on -one. Don't go anywhere.